Hey everyone, I believe I am live. And if you happen to be here last week, hopefully this is going much better. Um, Dr. Andy here, and this is our very first official Tuesday Night Raw, where we're going to go, where I'm going to do my very, very best to answer your questions about um, feeding raw um, with your animals. Um, most commonly dogs, right? And Keisha says, they can see me. Can you hear me? <laughs> would love some feedback. Um, but I thought I would get the ball rolling since this is um, the first live. And you may, and she says yes. Okay, good. Um, what was I, where was I? See and hear you. Awesome. Okay. Woohoo. Go YouTube this week. YouTube, I had a, quite a few choice words last week, but that was actually mostly my fault. Uh, so I thought tonight, if there are questions, awesome. Let, you know, throw me all your questions. We'll see what, um, where we go and um, what we do with that. But for those of you that are not familiar with who I am and what I do and how I got here feeding my animals, um, raw meat, I thought we could start there. And if you know me, you might be a little bored, so I apologies. Uh, but again, my name is Dr. Andy Harper, and I am actually a doctor of chiropractic and a certified animal chiropractor here in the state of Colorado. And I have been specializing in chiropractic care for dogs just shy of 20 years. Um, I've had I have been seeing clients day in and day out um, for all this time, and I've been a raw feeder for 10 years, which actually is, um, I know people that have been feeding raw, you know, 20, 30 years. So 10 years, I'm just a newbie at this, right? And so chiropractic care. And I, I live outside of the Denver metro area. And that's where I started my practice. I started my practice doing house calls for dogs, which 20 years ago, I was told I was insane by other animal chiropractors because they, they are like, you don't work on dogs, you work on horses. Well, I like horses well enough, but they're very, very big <laughs> and I'm not. And so that was a discrepancy that I never quite got over. And I'm like, and plus. Plus, uh, I have to go out in the hot. I have to go out in the cold. And it gets cold here in Denver. Um, dogs, they come in, right? They come into the air conditioning. They come into the heat. So I'm like, I like that a lot better. Um, plus, I'm just more of a dog person. So 20 years ago, I'm going to work on dogs. And I'm going to drive around Denver metro area and see dogs. And my father, by the way, bless his soul, um, thought I was insane, too. And um, and I did it with the help of an, a veterinarian that also had a house call business, and he, he believed in chiropractic. And slowly, I built up quite a practice. And I would travel all the way down to Colorado Springs and all the way up into Greeley and um, for many years, and now I work out of my home in in Golden. So, and, and it's definitely a smaller practice. Um, the physicality of um, adjusting dogs that may not be cooperative, that won't get on the table, and I'm crawling around on the floor has definitely caught up over the years, right? So, but when I started my career. Um, I did all the things everybody did with their animals, right? I went to the store and bought a bag of kibble and, you know, fed the dogs. And But through conversations and learning, because I learned the most from my clients, right? I always learn the most from my clients. Um, and just having these conversations and, you know, what are you feeding and why are you feeding? And I can't really recall one particular 
instance when someone said, you should feed raw meat and this is why. Like I don't remember one of those moments, but I think it was just kind of intuition that this whole big bag of dried nuggets may not be the best, the best plan. And I had one of my greatest teachers come into my life um, before I actually started my practice. It was 20 years ago in July that he came to live with us. His name is Jax, Jumpin' Jasper Jax. And I will probably refer to him very, very often. He was my black standard poodle. Um, I had a break between graduating chiropractic school and starting my practice because I had to wait for my license, right? Couldn't do anything. So I got a dog. Can't say that was the wisest choice. Um, had no job, was going to start a business, which I had no idea what the hell that entailed too. Um, see, still living at home. Well, I'm living back at home because I graduated school and have no money. Um, have no idea where I'm going to be living because really didn't want to stay there long, right? <laughs> um, but I got a dog. And I had grown up with greyhounds, so I have a really soft spot in my heart for sighthounds. I, I love them dearly, and they're quirky. And I wanted something different. You had greyhounds growing up. I wanted something different. So before I really knew about a lot of breeds, although I was that kid that went to the library and got the breed books, the AKC breed books, and read about breeds, um, I always thought I wanted a clumber spaniel. I had no idea no idea why. Never even met a clumber spaniel to this day. I don't believe. Um, random, right? So random. But anyway, I digress. So we were looking because we, my mom wanted something that didn't shed around the house, right? So poodles have hair. They don't shed. And we didn't want anything little. So we're going to get a big one. And back then people are like, they come big? <laughs> like, yeah, they come big. Um, or a Weimaraner because they had really short hair. And no offense to all my Weimaraner lovers out there. I'm really glad I went with a standard poodle. Um, they were probably more of my speed and um, definitely uh, click with them a little bit more. So Jax came to live with us in July of 2001, I think, 20 years ago, whatever the heck that was. And he he showed me so much, but he also came with what I now know would have been diagnosed as IBS from day one. Um, and honestly, he loved his kibble. He was my sweet tooth dog. Oh, MG, right? He, we'd have a barbecue at people over hot dogs, hamburgers, right? All that jazz. No one would see the poodle until the ice cream cake came out honest to God truth. He didn't care about the hamburgers. He wanted the ice cream and he was my sweet tooth dog and he loved his kibble. Except when he came to live with us, my mom's greyhound was in kidney decline, kidney failure. I don't know where she was exactly at the time, but my mom, before anybody I knew, found some random recipe on the internet what, well, maybe, I don't even know. It might have been in a magazine back then. I don't even know how much internet internet we had. Um, and was cooking for this dog. She had done some research. However, she did that. We must have had some internet at that point. <laughs> I'd like to think we did anyway. Um, and took her off the kibble and fed her what would be probably comparable to like our dehydrated raws, our honest kitchen. So it was like that and she would reconstitute it. I don't remember what was all in it. And boy, did jo Jax hate that. He hated that. I could not get him to eat, could not get him to eat. And we're trying and trying, but my God, he wouldn't even take treats. He was the least food made, food motivated dog I have ever met. Maybe not ever met, but he was up there. He was difficult his entire 13 and a half years when it came to food. Entire time. Um, 
And so he didn't like that. And I don't remember. I mean, this is a long time ago, so I don't remember all the details. He didn't like that. Um, and then, but we would get it in him. I mean, he wouldn't even eat hot dogs. Like we would cut up hot dogs for training and he'd be like, bleh, and walk off. He was so smart and such a shit too that he would, you know, sit a couple times and walk off. He'd do down, walk off. Like, I know this stuff, mother. Like, why do we have to do this again? Right. Um, and he was always like that, right? He was, I think, the a typical standard poodle above the rest. Um, but he, we took a class, training class, just a puppy class at PetSmart um, way back in the day. And he, it was Sunday afternoon in a PetSmart. So you know it's busy. And he was eight weeks long. And he slept through the entire class every Sunday for the six, seven weeks out of the eight weeks. No, no lie. The trainer thought it was the funniest thing. Looking back, that wasn't a well puppy. He wasn't feeling good. There was no reason to be sleeping through class, but I just didn't know. I thought that was him. He should have been interested in the other puppies. He should have been interested in all the shoppers. He should have wanted to walk around the store nothing. He would sleep through class. I literally would lean down, wake him up. He would do whatever command we were working on. He did it perfectly and he'd go back to sleep. That's not a well puppy. So one of my cardinal rules is your puppy should be driving you bonkers. They should be busy. They should be lively. They should be loving their food. They should be like, you're like, oh my God, don't wake the sleeping puppy. I need a break kind of thing. That's how puppy should be. And he was not like that. When people say, oh, he's the best puppy about any puppy, I get a little worried. I get a little concerned that maybe your puppy's not feeling great. Just file that back in the back of your head. Um, anyway, we did class, did that food. We went back to kibble. Um, he would only eat God, he would go on two, three day eating strikes every week. It was terrible. Um, I think we did a little raw with when Lucy was doing her kidney thing. I don't know. So, but so fast forward, he was now, gosh, maybe it's been longer than 10 years that I've been feeding raw because he was probably like eight ish when I'm like, okay. I've heard about this. I may have done a little research. I've talked to some people. I want to make this easy because I'm like my mom. I was not going to cook for my dogs. I'm not going to cook for me. I'm not cooking for my dogs. That's just like one of my rules. And so I started with, and this is a journey. And that's what I tell people about going raw. Some people can jump into the deep end of the pool. And I usually am that person. I'm usually jumping way in at the deep end of the pool and then like kind of drowning a little bit and then figuring out how to, how to navigate. But this time I did not do that. So you can, I've had clients. Oh my gosh. I had this amazing gal who came in with her pretty sore, sick puppy who had been on prednisone for a year trying to manage her pain. And she was, she was sore and she was not well and she was not moving well. And mom asked me a question. Um, I think it was the second visit, maybe the third visit for chiropractic care. She's like, okay, what do I need to do with this dog? I go, okay. Do you want it all? <laughs> and she goes, I want it all. I'm like, all right, you need to go raw. Here are the podcasts to listen to. Here's where you place your order. And this is what you do. And she jumped in the deep end of the pool, changed everything. This dog comes in so damn happy and doing so good. We reduced so much of the inflammation. She lost all of, not all of, because she's still on a little pred, but she lost a lot of that fluid retention that you have with that medication. And when you feed um, highly processed food, you get a lot of inflammation. So she's feeling better. She's moving really well. We're down to just chiropractic every month. And she's 11 or 12. So as a senior, very regular, once a month-ish. Um, 
and she's just rocking it. So some people do jump into the deep end of the pool. Others, like myself, I call it a journey. Um, and I started with a dehydrated raw, what I call the green slop. Um, and there's different brands out there on the market, Honest Kitchen, Grandma Lucy's, Sojo's, and that's where I started. And then I would cook more, generally it was ground turkey, for whatever reason that was, probably because it was cheap, right? Um, didn't even think about brown chicken. Um, and at the time, we just weren't doing a lot of beef or whatever. So anyway, I would make up more of that and I would add that to the green slop and they would have green slop. And Jack's was his usual eating style. Couple days on, couple days off. Oh, he had intermittent diarrhea, like all the IBS symptoms that I, you know, eight years later, I, I probably should have gotten a clue, but I didn't. Um, and, and then uh, gradually over probably that year, we transitioned into raw food. I found out where I could find it because I also had too many animals to feed um, retail. Um, it wasn't raw dog food and company at the time. It was a different brand, right? Um, and, and Jennifer, I'll get to your question here in just a second. Um, I don't remember where we started with the meat, honestly. And found another, what we call co-op in the world. It, it, it's not really a co-op and found another one and, and, and got my feet wet with the raw meat, which turned out to be easier because you just defrost, whey, put in the bowl. Um, I actually find if you're going to move away from kibble and any of the prepackaged stuff, um, I find, and you want to, people want to cook for their animals. And I, I don't understand that, honestly, because it's so much more work than raw. Um, raw is work in a different way. You better have room for it. You've got to figure out how, when to pick it up, if it works in your schedule, are they close by? Because the raw food I talk about is the stuff that you're going to, is not on the shelves. The stuff that's still on the shelves on the retail is still highly processed. Um, it's still sprayed with synthetic vitamins. It still has a lot of other ingredients that you may or may not want or may or may, or may, or may not bother your animals. Um, what I really like about finding just raw meat ground with the bone, ground with the organs. Um, there's nothing else added. And um, you'll hear me say this time and time and time again, I am a control freak of magnitude. It's the other reason I feed raw, because I want to know that they had beef muscle meat, beef liver, beef heart, beef bone today. I want to know that that's what they got. Now, every one of those beefs are a different animal, right? So you have different stuff going on. But it's not rice that used to come from Venezuela that came from China this time or this meat. It, 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 you, you don't know what's in this stuff. Um, and, I, and I really, it's funny. I actually have done this with my animals longer than I've done it with me. But I become quite the control freak with what I'm eating too. And there's nothing processed in my diet. I know, ex you know, I know that I had wild boar for lunch. I know I had... My husband's a hunter. Um, <laughs> I had beef for dinner. Like, I know I had those one things. Um, so that's what I really, really like about going to um, companies like Raw Dog Food and Company. And um, maybe there's one by you that you can find um, and incorporate that raw food into your animal's um, diet. So Jennifer has a question. She says, hi, Dr. Andy. My cat has been on a raw diet. I noticed she has tartar. The vet couldn't finish her dental last year. She is older now. Do you have recommendations? Oh, kitties. They are a different breed. Um, the vet couldn't finish the dental. Was she not doing well under anesthesia? Is that what you're referring to? Correct. Okay. Um, mm, that's a tough one. 
and you're going to have less almost lost her. Yeah. So we're not doing that again, huh? No more dentals. Um, if you have like that one in a million cat that will let you like pick at her teeth, you can pick at her teeth. <laughs> um, I wish you luck and hopefully, you know, you're not bleeding by the end of it. But if she's older, we also don't want to stress her out with that. But any tartar, actually on your dog's or your cat's teeth, if they'll let you Okay. Yeah. So just keep picking at it. She said she was scared to even go to the vet. I did um, pick last week and got a couple of pieces off. You can, you can use your nails and pick it off. Um, I know some of the breeders in the area actually have some scaling tools and they'll just pop off the tartar. Um, you can do that. It does not cover what's going on in the roots, like anything below the gum line that you may or may not see, that's not going to be handled um, by you doing that. But if she'll, you know, kind of get there and you can get some pieces off, do that. Um, I guarantee you that her eating raw has lessened the amount of titer that you would have to deal with. Because um, animals do not have, okay, our saliva... <laughs> Um, okay, let's do Keisha's question. It's a good question. Do bones actually help with controlling tartar in dogs and possibly cats? Yes, they actually do. Um, if you want to do the soup bones, soup bones, or just the beef bones, like knuckle bones, um, those round little bones, um, you can. Uh, just be aware that that's a very hard material and they do have the propensity to crack teeth here and there. I have this theory, completely my own anecdotal theory, that if you have dogs that have been brought up raw feeding, have chewed on those hard bones along with chicken necks, turkey necks, duck feet, chicken feet, have had bones and they've had a species appropriate diet their entire lives, they have stronger teeth. That's my anecdotal, anecdotal, my own theory on that. Now, Works great with dogs. Some dogs do a better job of clearing off all that tartar with bones than others. Um, kitties. I know people talk about cats like chewing on chicken feet, chewing, chewing on duck feet. Mine never did. Um, I don't know too many, but God, if they did, that would help, right? And I almost would bet money on once they get into their senior years, they're going to stop even if they did do it. Um, so if that answers your question, Keisha, now the, if you're, the hard bones are going to do a better job, but if they just do the softer bones, like chicken wings, chicken necks, chicken, turkey necks, that also keeps the tartar off. So back to Jennifer, she says she always gets mixed messages from vets and people saying, give them kibble to get the tartar off. It's a lie. It's an old wives' tale, and it's a big fat lie. Um, <laughs> um, big fat lie, and I'm going to tell you why. Okay, so next time you're having mashed potatoes, put them in your mouth, and they will start to dissolve because we have enzymes in our saliva called amylase that digest starches. Okay, they will start to dissolve. Okay, dogs do not have that enzyme in their saliva. They have teeth of a carnivore. They are designed to grab, rip, swallow. They don't have the flat molars we have. They really don't have the molars and the grinding capacity of like a horse, right? They don't do any of that. So when people say, my dog doesn't chew, no shit. They're not really designed to chew. They're designed to grab, rip, swallow. That is what those teeth are for. And so when you, and so they don't have a lot of enzymes in their saliva because they're not planning on having their meat or their food in their mouth for very long. It is designed to get into that stomach with the high acid to dissolve it. And then the short intense intestine and out it goes. Okay. So when you feed kibble, which is starch based, 
if it's got grains or it doesn't have grains, if it's just legumes, if it's just potatoes, if it's corn, whatever it is, it is 30 to 50 to 60 percent um, carbohydrate level. And so when they got that kibble in their mouth and it gets stuck, like, like you know, they they grabbed the mouthful and they did a couple chews and they swallowed most of it whole, but that stuff sat on their teeth. They have no enzymes to take care of that. So the starch actually sits on the teeth and contributes to more tartar, more dental disease. So that narrative that get the kibble to get the tartar off is a lie. Flat out lie. I would bet, bet money it's even a bigger lie in cats because they're obligate carnivores. They don't need a stitch of anything else but meat. So you can stop worrying that you're not giving your kitty kibble for the teeth. And I would bet money that you have less tartar to deal with because you are feeding raw. And kitties' mouths are, they're smaller. They don't chew on the stuff that the dogs chew on. I think if they were out catching more rabbits, more mice, um, more stuff and actually biting in, you know, they're going to like the mice, they're going to eat the heads, right? They'll eat the heads because the brain has the highest level of taurine in it and kitties need taurine. Um, it's not, it's an, it's an essential um, amino acid for them. And so, but they would crunch into the skulls, right? They would get a little bit of that bone, but our cats are really not doing that these days, unless you happen to have an indoor outdoor barn kitty. Um, and then do you really want them? Cause who knows where the animals have been and, and all of that jazz. So I'm not recommending that, but they don't chew on things. And they have these little mouths that God knows we can't brush or get into. So I, I, feel for you, Jennifer. Um, I would just keep picking at it and keeping a good eye on it, but it might just be something that um, she just has. Um, I hope that helps a little bit. Maybe put a couple of your worries to rest. Um, and yeah, that's what I got there. And and Ashley did say that some of her kitties chew on the, a fish skin roll. I haven't tried that with mine. So maybe I'll have to try that. I don't know. Mine are so persnickety as kitties are, right? And Ashley says, similar to Dennis telling us dry cereal would be good for our teeth. Well, it's almost closer. Yes, dry cereal. Yeah, the dry cereal that will stick. Or like, God, we were having so many problems so many years ago. All those... Um, fruit chews, those little fruit things we were given like the toddlers and they would stick on their teeth and stay there and rot them out. Right. Um, Keisha says, does gut biome support have any influence on tartar control? Just knowing how important the gut biome is, I'd go with yes. Can I tell you how or why? No. Um, but the gut biome, and this is even more recent. I mean, I knew it was, um, intermixed with the immune system, right? But now I'm hearing from some, you know, specialists or whatever you want to call them that your gut biome is your immune system and all of our guts, people, animals, um, are, quite diminished. Let's put it that way, right? But our gut biomes are our immune system. So, you know, why wouldn't it contribute to, um, to how much tartar an animal creates? Which, if you went back to and compared kibble-fed dogs, generally their teeth look so much worse. Just anecdotally, all my clients that come in um, generally kibble fed dogs teeth look worse, more tartar, more discolored, more periodontal, some more like redness in the gums, 
all of that going on. So we know the teeth are really related to the heart. Um, and, you know, and with all that kibble in the system, you have more inflammation. So you're going to have more leaky gut. So I think it is a vicious cycle that the better the gut biome is, the less microbes are flying around doing what they do. But if your immune system is better, you, you're able and you're eating a species specific diet, your gut biome is better that in theory, you'd have less tartar. Um, Jennifer says, since I won't be able to get her to the dental as a recommendation to keep her organs healthy. So like I just said, teeth are um, intimate with um, the heart. So if you can, if she's willing, I would get her some beef heart. Chop it up, mix it in with her raw. Make sure she's got a higher organ content. If you can get tripe in her, I would do that if she likes any blends with that. Um, I don't know what raw you're feeding or if that's all in there. But you can get just beef heart, chop it up, mix it in. Um, depending on my kitty's moods, where I defrost all the dog food and their food too. Um, sometimes there's organs in there. OMG, they love the heart. I mean, I've come back before I could get the bison heart or the beef heart all chopped up for the dogs. And it's been ripped open and they've been licking the juice and they've taken some bites out of it. And I'm, and then later that day, I'm trying to cut it up and they're on, we do this on the washing machine at home, <laughs> washer and dryer, and they're taking bites. So mine really like heart and you want to support um, like with like. So if you're having liver stuff, you feed liver. You're having heart stuff, you feed heart. If you're having kidney stuff, you feed kidney. Um, just got an herbal blend to mix with her food. What did Ashley say? I missed it. Yes, there are. Um, they, oh, there. what's the word I want? If this is what you're talking about, Ashley, uh, the plaque off, the plaque off, right? Okay. Feline naturals from New Zealand. Is it dehydrated raw then, or is it frozen raw? Jennifer can't keep track of all the blends and brands, but if I'm on the right page with Ashley, which I can't find her comment in here, um, plaque off. Like there are those products that get the plaque off the teeth. And I do believe they work. The fish skin roll. Okay. That's what she's talking about. Yes, absolutely. Um, you can try the herbal blend. The plaque offs and they're green. And that's an actual brand. And I think there's some other ones. They do have um, kelp in them which can affect the thyroid. Not necessarily in a bad way, but just keep that in mind because um, there's iodine in the in that food source, which is, again, not a bad thing. Um, but if your animal happens to be on thyroid med, it can actually alter that. So just keep that in mind when you're um, doing something like that. Um, coconut yogurt for kitties. Nope. They're obligate carnivores. Um, so they, okay, chewing on the fish roll. Yeah, give it a whirl. Um, cool. I would stay away from the coconut yogurt with kitties. And yeah, the add water. Okay. And you're letting that sit for a very long time, right? Like, Six, eight, 10, 12 hours. Um, I'm hoping. Um, I know everyone's gone to the dehydrated raw because it's easy, right? It's not messy. It's not bloody. And um, 
I, I, I buy it and I know Ashley buys it and I use it for treats. Um, but I don't think, and this may not be your case, Jennifer, at all, but um, I don't think we rehydrate it well enough to get the amount of moisture back in it that it really needs for our animals. I think it's a nice cheat. I think it's nice to have around. Um, <laughs> yes, bloodier the better when it comes to kidney health. Yes, bloodier the better. I mean, mine even, God, whatever leaks out into the container, I pour on their food. I mean, I pour all the fluids I can back into my animals, um, especially since we live up here in Colorado and it's dry as hell up here. Um, and it's, so Keisha, you add the water, but then does it sit and actually just absorb it? That's where I think we don't give it enough time. Um, literally like get her dinner ready at breakfast and let it sit. Um, yeah, I would really... I would really like it to sit for a very long time, but that's me. Um, and that's where I, I really like the frozen raw. But I also know that a lot of kitties won't do the frozen raw. They really like the dehydrated. And I guarantee you it's because of the higher sugar content in all the dehydrated. Because they always add stuff to it. Um, it's not just like there's treats out there that are just freeze-dried chicken, right? And that looks nothing like your, your dehydrated raw. Like there's other stuff in it. Um, but it still better than kibble. <laughs> still better than kibble. <laughs> um, yeah, the kitties to raw. Like I was really lucky with my two. Um, I got them from a client on a little ranchette out in Parker. They were hunting outside with mom. They were never in a shelter. They were never exposed to anything, um, upper respiratory, any of that. They came here. Um, I think I gave them one little canned cat food and then they went raw. And so that that's just what they did. Now getting older cats to um, switch over to raw, you would think would be a no-brainer. You would just think this wouldn't be a big deal. Obligate carnivores, I'm giving you meat, right? And they would go, oh, thank you, and eat, right? No, 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 not our cats, right? Um, so getting them switched over, I have met a few that went, oh, this is awesome. Thank you very much. But the vast majority will not leave their um, their kibbles, right? Their crunchies, right? Their crunchies. Because they are literally addicted to the sugar and starches in it. Even more so than um, dogs. And, and there is, you know, some addiction in there too, right? There is that love of sugar, that starch. Um, so we do have to be creative. Ashley says she's got a Jackson Galaxy video on how to get them to raw. Um, a lot of times with kitties, just because um, they're shitty, <laughs> if you put like little bits of it in weird places around the house and they think they actually shouldn't be eating it, um, they'll like it better. Um, you, you got to play with different flavors. Like mine will not eat anything that flies that they don't, which is weird, right? They're cats. They should like birds, right? They should like turkey and chicken. No, mine like, they must be like, um, you know, pumas in a, a past life because they want the venison. They want the elk. They want the beef. They want the pork. They want all these big animals, you know, channeling their inner pumas. Um, so you have to play with that, um, play with different brands. So don't buy too much of anything. And a lot of people can may or may not even get them to raw, but if you can at least get them to canned, which is going to have a much 
higher um, meat content and less of all the additives. Uh, that's a great place to start. Um, if you can get them all the way there, but they still need five crunchies a day, you know what? You work with what you got. But if everybody, if they're feeding dry, not willing to give it up, don't leave it out all day. Kitties need to be fed meals like dogs twice a day. That's it. Nothing in between because they actually need a chance to drop. Um, they, they need to balance their hormones, their glucose, their insulin, the blood sugar levels. And if they're constantly snacking throughout the day because they're bored, because this is what they do, because you put out new food and, and, and it's a habit, that's where we see a lot of thyroid dysfunction. We see a lot of um, thyroid dysfunction. What's the other one I want? Kidney failure, um, diabetes in kitties. Um, come from that. So worst worst case scenario, not getting the dog, the cat off kibble, do two meals a day. I even think people that are doing snacks and lunch or they're hungry now are actually causing a lot of dysregulation in all those hormones, that insulin, the glucose and all of that, um, even with that lunch in the middle. We're talking adult healthy animals. It's a little different with puppies. I've kind of changed my point of view on that. And definitely our seniors are, are different too when it comes to that. Okay, and then she eats the frozen rabbit. Cool. Awesome, Jennifer. Good job. So like a probiotic packet from the pet store, the brand Coconut Cult Clean, no sugar, probiotic plain yogurt. Kitties are obligate carnivores. They don't, they, mm, no, no, coconut cult. So it's a probiotic yogurt that's made from coconuts. Am I getting that? <laughs> um, and everybody runs to the probiotics. Um, hmm. And the more research and the more people I listen to, both for people and for animals, we could be doing a lot more damage just going and grabbing a probiotic. I don't use probiotics in my house. Um, and I'm going to amend that statement in a minute with my animals. I have not, gosh, when's the last time? On a regular basis. I do not do probiotics on a regular, just because basis. Okay. And like I said, the, some of the new research, some of the new things I've been listening to, just grabbing your multi-strain billions of lactobacillus bottles could actually be causing the gut issues. Now they should always be used after an, a round of antibiotics. And that's only if you ever have to use antibiotics and, um, that's all whole different soapbox. Um, answer your question really quick, Jennifer. If you if you feel the need, I'd much rather you did a straight up dairy yogurt that's not plant. Like at least your dairy coming from milk would come from an animal for the kitty. But I don't I don't know. Does she would she even eat it? I don't know. I think it'd be better if you really wanted to do some probiotics is just getting like, I don't even know which ones for you to go get, because if we're going to just go to our stores and grab a bottle of it, are we doing more harm than good? I don't know. Jury's still out. Brand new information for me. But like I said, I, yes, goat's milk. Um, I don't do probiotics. I actually, that's like intestine stuff, right? And everybody goes to the probiotics and I'm not sure where that all came from, but we've got a lot of things going on up here. Stomach, liver, gallbladder, pancreas, before we even get to the intestines that are completely ignored. 
So do we not have enough um, hydrochloric acid? Is our pH in our stomach not low enough? to digest everything properly. Are we doing digestive enzymes? And I say that all the time, get them digestive enzymes. And they're like, well, I have them on probiotics. Not the same thing, people. Digestive enzymes, your amylase, your protease, your lipase, they digest your starches, your fats, your proteins. And that's what's starting in the stomach. Um, I even do a standard process product with... Um, my little, my puppy Torch, he seems to, if he gets a little too much fat, he pukes. Don't know why. He's nine months old. And maybe we're working, his digestive system still um, getting its bearings. But that actually has HCL peptate in it. It actually has some of the HCL to lower that stomach acid um, so he can digest that better. He can digest everything better. Um, I just started a new brand for myself that's a digestive enzyme, um, which I have been doing for myself on and off for years. Um, I think they're far more valuable, far more effective um, for all of these digestive issues than probiotics have ever been or possibly will be on a regular daily basis. And what if we don't need to be on something like that's my target, like. I want to actually fix something so I can then stop taking it. And that may be different when you're dealing with a, a senior animal or a senior person. Maybe they're just on it. Um, but Ashley mentioned goat's milk. And so if you can find answers, fermented goat's milk, it's in the freezer section of most stores around here. Um, and they look like the little milks we used to get at school. Um, buy the smallest one, but it is stock full of probiotics in there, um, plus other nutrients. And it's actually considered like a complete meal if they do stop eating. Um, and, you know, is there inflammation because it's a milk product and most adult animals should not need dairy. That's why most of us have trouble with dairy. Um, probably most of our dogs actually have trouble with dairy. Um, a little string cheese here and there for training. I mean, I use cream cheese to get pills in dogs. I mean, like, let's not go crazy. Um, so I pulled all the goat's milk out. My current standard poodle Crosby cannot live without his goat's milk. Like he in the horse world would be called a hard gainer. Like I cannot get weight on this dog. He is such a skinny mini and he is so busy and he just burns it all off. And he actually needs that goat's milk in there just to hold him over till the next meal. And he doesn't seem to have any issues from it. Um, but I stopped giving it to everybody else and they all seem fine without it. Um, I do, most likely, um, Dairy could, in your animal, cause a mild inflammation reaction. So keep that in mind. There is New Zealand green mussel in the dehydrated food. What is that for? Green mussel is um, for joint health. Um, I don't know much more than that. I know it's considered a superfood. Um, what about goat's milk? I mixed a finger, dipped it in her food. Okay. Um, so that's more joint. It is um, from the sea, so I bet it's full of vitamins and minerals. Um, that might be a nice little um, addition for the nutrient profile. Um, I know it is in... Zewi Peak 2, which is what I use for treats in my practice and have for, I don't even know how long, probably 15 years. Um, I love the Zewi Peak. Yeah, the omega-3s. Because it's from the sea, your your sea animals, your, your fishes um, are much higher in omega-3s than sixes. So they have a better profile to balance out all the sixes. For those that are on a conventional kibble diet, they are high in omega sixes, which are in pro-inflammatory, pro-disease. 
And most Americans eating the standard American diet are also heavy on omega-6s. Um, they're called PUFAs. They're called seed oils. They're called industrialized seed oils. Um, they're polyunsaturated fats. And they are unstable. So if you have this, I just did an email. That's why I kind of know some of this stuff. Um, <laughs> so the polyunsaturated fats are unsaturated and unstable. Then your saturated fats, like all those fats that we were told for years to never eat, right, are actually the stable fats that actually do contribute to um, our nutrition and our health much more than the polyunsaturated. So the PUFAs, the seed oils, the unsaturated. Um, so yeah, but anything from the sea, um, your fish, green mussels, kelp, what it, plankton, phytoplankton, whatever else I'm blanking on, um, are going to have much more omega-3s, which would balance out um, the profile with um, omega-6s. And you are better off green muscle, whole food, um, whole fish, sardines out of a can. Mine love that. Better, at, better yet, you can buy frozen sardines and uh, from Raw Dog Food and Company and uh, many other places. The whole food is always better. Always better. I know vets have stepped into this world a little bit and telling people to put fish oil on the kibble or add fish oil. You really got to know your source. You really got to know the packaging. You really need to know the travel. You need to know how long it's sitting in a hot warehouse because they are so unstable that they oxidize and degrade and go rancid so fast that most, from my understanding, I bet we could find it somewhere out there on the internet. Most fish oil is already rancid by the time you're giving it to your dogs, which is also causing another issue. Um, lamb heart is the first ingredient in the feline niche. Awesome. Yeah, lamb heart, rock on. That's perfect. Yeah, um, I like the meats, if you can, the majority of the time, be ruminants. So your beef, your lamb, your venison. Right now, I you know, uh, pork is not a ruminant. Your birds are not ruminant. Um, but I rotate in pork. I rotate it. We act, I actually have some chicken up there right now that I rotate through. I don't buy a lot of chicken. Um, they're just not fed great stuff. Even if they're out squawking and walking the pastures, um, they're generally fed soy, um, generally fed corn. And that just makes it into the meat. It just messes up that omega-6 and 3 profile in the chicken meat that I don't do a lot of it. But I do. I rotate it through, right? Okay. Ashley's, I think, still talking about the fish. Yeah. So Ashley has a good friend, right? Is this what we're talking about? And we got calamari. They were these dried, flat things in calamari. It was so cool. And some fish roll, fish skin rolls. Um. And some, I don't know what else you got. No, you're not talking about that. Never mind. She's not, ta I'm not talking about anything. <laughs> anything else, folks, as, um, as we wrap this up. I hope we helped you out, Jennifer. Um, and Ashley, if you can get me that video um, from Jackson Galaxy, that would be awesome. We can put that down in the show notes. Um, Anything else, folks? Ruminant. Oh, yes, ruminant. Um, they have multiple stomachs. So the animals that have multiple stomachs. Cows, I think, have four. Goats are ruminants. Sheep, lamb, venison. So the animals that chew on their plants, swallow it, regurgitate, chew on their cud, swallow, regurgitate, regurgitate, um, it are ruminants. And they're the ones that have the bacteria in the stomachs that actually do the digesting of all of the undigestible grasses and weeds and stuff that they eat. Um, my understanding is cows will eat anything. Um, 
I even heard at one point they put a magnet in one of their stomachs so it would um, collect all the nails and metal that they would eat out grazing. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. Uh, I always buy raw food meat from Mud Bay. I haven't heard of Mud Bay. Hmm. I'll have to check them out. But that's what a ruminant is. There we go. Mud Bay. All right. And if you can't hear the group going crazy, perfect timing because I think my husband's home and they're going to bark their fool heads off. So I want to thank everyone for showing up today and being here and supporting me on my very first live. I hope um, you learned something. I hope it was helpful. I will be back. Um, yes, there's my cue, right? I will be back next Tuesday, same time, um, planning on spending an hour and we'll just kind of hash out some of these questions and some of the roadblocks, um, that you're having with your animals. Um, if you're brand new to raw or long time and, and struggling with something, um, I invite you all here, um, tell your friends, um, and, like the live. I'm supposed to ask you to like it, right? It gets it out there. Hmm. I don't know. I have what, 21 subscribers. So I, I really appreciate um, you being here and starting this new journey. All right. Till next week. How much fun can you have with your animals? <laughs>